civilization is being sacrificed for the opportunity of a very small number of people. We urgently need financial, political and social innovations that enable us to overcome this structural dependency on growth. We need to change the system. This isn't cleaning up the beaches in the case of plastic a little bit faster. That's vital, that has to be done. But you need to stem the flow. Go Simon explores sustainable change and the women inspiring it. Who are they? What made them who they are? How do they read the world they live in? Our guests share their story, roots, passions and hopes for the future. They tell us more about the alternatives and strategies they developed to tackle climate change. Our Simon today is Carly Wilson. With Carly, we talked about conservation environmental documentaries, rubber balloons, plastic waste, koalas and land clearing, conservative politics and fake science. Hi, Carly. Hi. Welcome at Go Simon. Thank you for giving us some time today. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Carly, you have a long professional background in conservation, wildlife care and habitat management. You've worked for the RCPA Wildlife Clinic in Canberra, Australia, for several years and more recently worked as a fauna spotter, relocating animals away from sites of habitat destruction. You're also a film producer. You launched last year a documentary called Rubber Jellyfish about the ingestion of released helium balloons by endangered marine animals. You were born in Canberra and you grew up in Washington. How was it to grow there and what kind of childhood did you have? I had an amazing childhood. I think we were really fortunate to move to America, actually, because my dad comes from a big family. So I got to grow up with, I think, 26 cousins or something. <laughs> and we all lived really close to each other. So that was amazing. And for anyone that's been to Washington, it's just an incredible place. There's two huge mountain ranges through the state. And at the base of both of those mountain ranges, temperate rainforest. It's incredible wilderness. We did a lot of camping. I couldn't have asked for a better place to grow up. It definitely shaped the person that I am now. What type of souvenirs do you have from it? And how were your parents talking to you, considering you, influencing you? I do have a few souvenirs. I actually just went back recently to visit my family and I brought back a tiny little vial of ash from when Mount St. Helens erupted in 1981, which was actually a couple of years before I was born. But it's fun to have that little keepsake sitting on my bookcase now. My parents definitely instilled um, a huge love for the environment. I remember there was one hike that we went on when I was a little girl. It went through a rainforest and we were expecting it to lead to some beautiful vista, which was usually the case on those hikes. But this one just led us to a clear cut, just a huge pasture that had been just completely cut down every single tree. We stood there for a long time just looking at it. And my parents were both wondering, was this the intention of the high? You know, did they take us through this beautiful rainforest just to show you what we're missing when you cut it all down? Or or did they just cut it all down? And bad luck, that's the end of the hike. But that's one memory that's really stuck in my mind. And professionally, were they involved in the environment space uh, mm. at all? No, not at all. I think just when you live in such a beautiful place, you can't help but love for it and care for it. Having said that, though, even though my parents instilled this great love of the environment, I definitely ended up being much more of a greenie than anyone else in my family. <laughs> I think possibly I also just came into the world this way. I actually think that I just feel like I have no choice. So you then chose to study a Bachelor of Science in Wildlife Science more mm -hmm. specifically, and then you did a Master of Animal Studies. Why this decision to, to, to study more about this and were your parents encouraging you to do that? My parents were incredibly encouraging, probably borderline demanding that both <laughs> my brother and I attend university, but I'm so grateful for that. And the reason that they felt so strongly about it was that was just an opportunity that they never had. My dad was raised in a family with extreme domestic violence. Something like going to university just wouldn't have been possible. He went into the military. And my mother, as amazing as her parents were, and I was extremely close to them, but they kind of had an attitude that university isn't for girls. So um, her brother did attend university. And by what she's told me, the expectation was basically don't get pregnant until yeah. you're adult. Good luck to you. They were very loving parents, but I think she sensed that she kind of missed out on that opportunity. And it was really important to both my parents that we not miss out on that opportunity. So I am extremely grateful for that. 
When did you move back to Australia? I think it was 2006 that I moved back here. There was a couple kind of reasons. I was kind of chasing a guy, as as embarrassing as it is to admit that. But I think that's the case for why a lot of people move overseas. But that abruptly fizzled into nothing. And I was happy to stay here. But probably the bigger motivation was I had been looking for work after I finished my wildlife science bachelor's. And I almost got a position at the International Snow Leopard Trust in Seattle. And I don't think I've ever wanted a job more than I wanted that job. So it just really broke my heart when I didn't get it. Even though my grown up adult self looks at my younger self and says, you did really well to get as far as you did. But at that time, it was just devastating. And then I also was given a position as a zookeeper at the Point Defiant Zoo in Tacoma in Washington State. And they said, we'll phone you to let you know when you're actually going to start. I didn't hear from him. And then and I was in a snowstorm, an actual blizzard in Boston when I finally managed to get them on the phone. And she said, oh, no, we've lost the funding and that position's not available anymore. So they weren't actually going to tell me they were just going to blow me off. And after that, I was just so devastated and just kind of depressed and started looking to other paths. And I did have dual citizenship as an Australian. I actually just started cold calling people. Anyone that worked for any kind of wildlife organization, I just called them and said, do you have any positions going? And I ended up that way hearing from the CEO at the RSPCA in Canberra. And he said, well, I'm actually going to be in California. If you would like to come down, I'd be happy to meet with you. And again, my mother, very supportive. She flew us down together. I met with him and he said, if you do want to come over, I'll be happy to give you some temp work. Okay. And that's how I came. Mm. And and, uh, and then that mm. job ended up turning into a full-time position. And how and did just, you enjoy those roles, doing are, what you love? The RSPCA was amazing. It was very intense and there was a lot of problems in how the place was run, which ended up blowing up in the press years after I left. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, so there was a lot of problems there. What um, type of problems? Uh, just a lot of bullying, I guess, coming from the very oh, top. Oh, right, right. I don't want to say too much about it, but it was mm. a very uncomfortable place to work. Mm-hmm. And so I ended up leaving and that broke my heart, really, truly did. I had never had a job like that before, you know, working hands-on with wildlife, wombats yes. and possums yeah. and, you know, incredible animals and having this close experience with them and and being able to see them come in at the brink of death and being able to nurse them through to release and and that was incredible so that was very difficult to walk away from but ultimately I did and it actually took a few years for me to kind of emotionally recover from that I ended up becoming a support worker for a while and and that was great as well but eventually then I moved to Queensland and that's when I started doing the fauna spotter work and got back into wildlife can you talk a bit more about that role of fauna spotter So fauna spotting, it's actually a unique role to Queensland. I'm pretty sure we only have fauna spotters in Queensland. It started because habitat was coming down. So trees were coming around and koalas were coming down with them. So koala spotters were brought in to kind of try to spot the koalas in the trees and to minimize that damage. Koalas are an amazing flagship species in that way. So by protecting them, we then protect so many other species because you you almost never find a koala on a site. It does happen, but you'll always find something. So because we have koalas here, all the other animals could be relocated as well. But I ultimately moved into film out of frustration over that. Even though it's amazing to catch these animals and you're literally, trees come down and you literally go running in with bags and you're just pulling lizards and, and geckos and birds sometimes and possums. You're literally pulling them out of the trees. So it's not prior to the, to the actual development. Usually someone will go through beforehand and sort of do a survey and scout out what habitat is there and what animals are likely to be there. But no, you don't actually know what's there until the trees come down and anything could be there. So you get to these sites. It could be a housing development. It could be a new Bunnings. A lot of the time it's a new Bunnings. Oh, really? (laughs) Jeez, it seems like there's a lot of Bunnings. At least when I was doing it, they were going up everywhere. Um, It could be a pipeline. It could be a mine. And they will let you know when you arrive at the site, these are the threatened, vulnerable to extinction and actually endangered animals that we think possibly could be on this site. So the question in your head is, so why are we taking the trees down? So that was the frustration that made me want to pursue something else because the Mm. land can only support so many animals. There is that carrying capacity. So you can't always be relocating the animals. That's not the solution. And when they have done translocation studies, it's very poor, the results. A lot of animals don't survive it. And so we have to get to a point where we just are able to leave the trees there. From a climate change point of view, we need those trees and the animals need them most of all. 
we have to change the attitude. Yeah. And this is a bit of a side topic, but my partner and I still rent. We don't we don't own a home yet. We want to. And I was recently looking into the first homeowner's grant and I found out that that only applies to new builds, to new developments. And I said to the guy on the phone, why is that? I said, I've worked on these habitat clearing sites for the new developments and it's shocking what happens. Mm -hmm. I said, if you were there, you would be shocked. I've seen a koala come down and hit the ground and die. So the policy actually encourages exactly. new development. Exactly. I said, clearing. I would prefer to buy an older home. I don't really want to support the new developments. I said, why is that? And he thinks it's to support the building industry. This particular guy says you get $15,000 from the first homeowner grant, and then the actual developers will give you another $15,000. That's $30,000 toward your first home. A lot of people are going to do that, aren't they? A lot of young people don't just have $30,000. I mean, who wouldn't want to save $30,000? So <laughs> it's going to just keep pushing the habitat further and further and further and further out. Mm. So at this point of time, you haven't noticed any change in the way those habitat are protected? No, I haven't. Took my two little girls. I've got a three-year-old. Mm old and a one-year-old to a rally about what's going on with koalas the other day, just demanding better legislation. Because with koalas in particular, there is more that's required if a koala is on site. It is a much bigger deal and the, and the developers hate koalas because of it. It slows everything down. But all it does is slow everything down. So mm. this is an endangered species. You go to any tourist shop and every third item is something to do with koalas. So many people come to this country to see koalas. You go to Dream World where people are holding the koalas and there's a line a mile long. Koalas are so important to our economy. And yet, if there is a koala on a habitat site, all it does is slow them down. They can still clear the trees. The, the actual trees that the koalas are eating, they're allowed to keep throwing them down onto the ground. Koalas are very difficult to see. When you look through that habitat, there's a lot of termite mounds high in the tree, and they're sort of just a gray lump. Guess what a koala is? It's a gray lump. They're very, very difficult to see. And even if you've been doing it for absolutely years, you could miss them. And they need that land. There was actually a, a habitat clearing site in Kumara, and they translocated koalas to Lower Beachmont. I was keeping a very close eye on the news recently because that's where the fires were headed. Oh, yes. So yeah. if it's not one thing, yeah. it's another. You know, we need to just learn how to just hands off, mm. just say enough is enough. I heard that Norway had actually banned habitat loss. It's mm. important. You've recently uh, released a documentary called Rubber Jellyfish, mm. and it's about the ingestion of released helium balloons by indigenous marine animals. Can you tell us more about this film? Rubber jellyfish is something I stumbled into quite by accident, actually. I was doing a master's degree and studying bat testicles, of all things. <laughs> and part of that was doing CT scans on the brains of um, uh, museum specimens of skulls, microbats. And my supervisor suggested that I do a similar study using CT technology on sea turtles, to uh, looking at the float turtles. So the turtles that have eaten plastic or some other man-made item that they shouldn't be eating, and it caused them to float at the top of the water they can't actually dive down to hunt. But with an ordinary x-ray, you can't actually see what it is they've eaten. So they thought maybe CT would be a different way to go. But the first step in any study, of course, is just to do your background research. And I learned that out of the University of Queensland, Kathy Townsend had already done some in incredible work and found that of the float syndrome turtles, or of all the deceased turtles that they were finding around Queensland, 78% of the rubber contents in those animals was actually balloons and balloon fragments. So my first thought was, what does does the balloon industry have to say about that? And by the way, the reason they think that sea turtles are eating so many balloons is because when they burst in the sky, they actually burst into a jellyfish shape. So that's why we call the film Rubber Jellyfish. But yes, my first thought after I realized what was happening was what does the balloon industry have to actually say about that? So I did a quick Google search and I found a big balloon store that was near me on the Gold Coast. And their website actually said that balloons are environmentally friendly, they are biodegradable, and they are not harmful to wildlife, and in particular, not harmful to sea turtles. And they say, well, right. um, latex is rubber. Rubber comes from the rubber tree. It's a tree. It's yeah. natural. Um, when they actually manufacture the balloon, they add all kinds of chemicals, and it's not a natural product anymore. And even if it were, the impact it's having on the animals is just extreme. I saw that the way they were coming up with this idea, what they were hiding on was a piece of fake science. And it had been paid for by the balloon industry in the 80s. And it made all of those claims. Balloons are biodegradable, environmentally friendly. It even said, if a piece of a balloon 
spoon were to be ingested by an animal, it would just slide straight through, no problems. You, they just made all kinds of claims that you, you just can't make in science. You need to have your references. It didn't have anything like that, and it was never published. It was just a piece of fake science. And meanwhile, there had been other studies that had been done that showed very clearly that balloons were a huge problem for wildlife, not just sea turtles. So I had a change of direction at that point. I thought, there's already been enough studies that have been done that aren't doing anything. And so maybe my role here is just to raise awareness to them and just sort out this bullshit <laughs> because <laughs> that piece of fake science was on every single balloon store website I could find all over the world. Some people call it the oak leaf study. Some people might have heard that. When you realized the problem, why did you decide to do a film? How did you approach that I had been interested in film production for a long time, and I'd done a little bit of TV presenting kind of stuff, just small budget documentaries that other people had been doing. Mm -hmm. So most people that make a film, the normal route would be to go to film school. And I did consider that, but the issue was so pressing because people were hearing that balloons were biodegradable and environmentally friendly. And I even have a brochure from a balloon store here in Brisbane that said that they were good for the environment. It said, save a tree, buy a balloon. Because of that balloon release ceremony, had become popular and and then social media was exacerbating the problem uh, because then it became uh, popular all over the world. People were going right up to the ocean sometimes for funerals and things like that and mm. releasing a hundred balloons and that still happens. So the film luckily has been changing policy around the world. Oh is, yes, I was going to mm -hmm. ask uh, if it had an influence on yeah. since the release. What what has been the feedback more generally on on this and do you feel it's changed habits? It has changed habits for many, many people. And there's a much bigger growing awareness because of it, even within the balloon industry. Because I was active on social media as I was making the film. So as I was saying that we were wrapping up, we were in the edit, that kind of thing, I was starting to get the hate mail from the balloon industry. <laughs> and they were starting to put a lot of posts out to their communities, basically trying to invalidate my work before anyone had ever seen it. But that all stopped when the film came out because they had nothing to hide behind. I actually tr tried to give the balloon industry as much credit as I could in the film, there were particular people high up in the industry that made sure that the industry were not aware of that information. And that's all highlighted in the film. And one of those people in particular has actually left the balloon industry. And I've been told by some insiders that that was a result of the film. And an organization actually emerged called the Pro Environment Balloon Alliance, which are actually fighting to have balloon release ceremonies banned across the country. That's, that's been it. an amazing change. Because before this, the, the attitude from the balloon industry was, if you want to release a balloon, that's fine. Just don't have any plastic cords or anything like that attached because plastic's not biodegradable. But if you just want to release the latex balloons, that's fine. But this new organization that's emerged is, is trying really hard to change that. So that's been amazing. But also here in Queensland, they've banned balloon release ceremonies. What's been amazing is the film has been used by particular activists to really make a lot of change. So it looks like there's going to be a similar legislation passed soon in Western Australia. And then there was actually a fellow in Maine, a high school student, and he screened the film to his high school. And then he also screened the film to his community. And he invited a whole lot of people in um, political offices. And they've actually banned just in his town, but it's actually illegal now to have a, any kind of balloon outside. It, may, it might just be helium balloons, but it's, it definitely goes beyond the release ceremonies where you can't even have a helium balloon. And that was coming from an 18-year-old. There's actually been a lot of changes like that. Even when we first released just the trailer, a little town called Bainbridge Island, which is basically a bedroom community out of Seattle, they banned balloon release ceremonies straight away. Oh, it's that's got, excellent. It, what's been cool about it is a lot of environmental documentaries, often people walk away and they have been informed and they've been overwhelmed. <laughs> and they go and they have a cocktail and a cigarette and they try to forget about it because it's just too much. The value in this film was that it focused on one item. Anyone can do something about that. And anyone can change their behavior around one thing. I just Did you independently fund the production of the film? I got a couple of grants, just small micro grants from an organization called the Pollination Project. And I would recommend anyone that's doing any kind of social change project, doesn't have to be a film, any project at all, get onto the Pollination Project because I think they try to give a thousand dollar grant every day. And that's a thousand dollars US. That's amazing. If you've just got some idea and you just need that little bit of money, sometimes you just need a little bit of money to get it started. That's what they're for. And then I got a follow up grant for, of more money to keep it going. And we did some crowdfunding as well and just bits and pieces. We put a little bit of our money and we kind of just scraped along and begged and pleaded. And then my partner did a lot of the filming and I would drag, oh, okay, drag okay. friends into it. And yeah. 
and I think that's part of why it's done so well because there are so many people involved mm-hmm. and so many people had a stake in it and really cared about it. More than balloons, I, it brings on the table, and new movie does that, mo- bring on the table the broader issue we, f- we face with waste and plastic waste in mm-hmm. particular of all sorts. And we know it causes major issues to the wildlife, but also to our health. We know now that we inhale microplastics. Now it's so bad that mm-hmm. it rains microplastics in certain regions of yeah, the world. Some studies have found that by incentivizing recycling, it is actually not enough. Mm-hmm. It doesn't tackle the underlying problem of unsustainable production and the consumption of plastic, mm-hmm. like just putting to the yellow bin is not mm-hmm. solving anything. So what do you think, in your point of view, the solutions are? What do you think uh, could could help tackling the problem and also raise awareness around those problems? It's going to take a lot of work at a lot of different levels. And you're right about the recycling. I did hear that when recycling came in, plastic manufacturing went through the roof because people thought, oh, well, it's a closed system, but it's not. And when you recycle something, you might recy- recycle a plastic bottle and it becomes a lawn chair. And then you have to throw that away. So we have to move away from single use products of all kinds. I mentioned to you before we started, one of your other guests that you had a few weeks back, she spoke about the notion of privilege and how that is important to keep in mind. And that's something that I've felt strongly myself. I couldn't care more about this than anyone else. But there are times when I can't make the best choice. And often it's because of finances. When I was making the film, we were just living on my partner's income while I did it. And I was also having two little kids at the same time. And he works for himself, so money can kind of fluctuate. So some weeks it wasn't possible for me to go to the grocery store and the farmer's market and the bulk food store. And at the bulk food store, it might cost six times as much for certain products or more, especially things like dishwashing soap, where your options are pretty much to get it in plastic or to buy it in bulk for eight times more. A lot of it is education and creating those habits because even though sometimes I would have to make a choice that I might not want to make because of finances, there's certain things that have just become habit. I would never buy a plastic sandwich bag for the rest of my life, no matter what. It's just a habit. I just have other ways of packing things up that I would never go back to that. So that's important, too, is just getting the information out there of the alternatives and so that people can start making those better habits. But there's some people, I hate to say it, but there's always going to be a sector of the community that they just don't really care that much. They might be denying that it's a problem for some political reason. And and that's why I think that better legislation, it just has to happen because some people are just not going to do better. And some people can't afford to do better. So, for example, I saw in Sweden, when they have cherry tomatoes and strawberries, those are packaged up in brown paper cardboard packaging. That's a legislation thing that we can do. So if people are trying to improve the the plan, Planet, they don't have to go to the farmer's market necessarily. We need to make it so that no matter where you're at, if, if you're a normal supermarket shopper and you're just not going to be a farmer's market shopper, some people just aren't going to do that. Legislation can help make the packaging options better and, and improve things. So it, it's going to take it's going to take all different scales. And as it becomes, especially with packaging, you know, mandatory to have better options, that's going to improve some of the privilege elements of it. If you can get something that's package free at a lesser price, because that's that's just the norm, then that's going to be better for everybody. One of my closest friends, actually, she has a sustainable fashion business in California. It's called Garment Hub. She went to the Copenhagen Fashion Summit recently. And one of the things she learned there was sustainable fashion. So actually garments where you actually look at the entire supply chain and it's ethical all the way through. Those items are by and large only purchased by wealthy white women. So there's a huge element of privilege going on. That's where legislation is important. We need to ban certain behaviors. And if that means that clothing becomes more expensive, in my opinion, so be it, because we've got so much of it. And that's because you can go to Kmart and buy a singlet for $2. That sort of stuff is just unacceptable. And what does it say about the amount that people are paid at the end of the chain oh, as totally. well? totally. And the conditions, mm. you know? I yeah. mean, you hear of entire factories in India collapsing. <laughs> you know, they're just the, mm. the buildings are not sound. And It I, is all reframing yeah, the, the way we consume as mm. well, like questioning the need of things. Like, do we actually need 10 
and jeans. Absolutely. Mm. Bringing back a bit of minimalism into our lives, focusing more on what's important and not this extreme amount of excess. How do you feel we communicate about uh, climate change at the moment? Do you feel it's efficient? We are seeing more and more message out there. I think there's a response. Definitely, we're seeing it with the youth protests mm. about climate change. Do you feel, though, that we are communicating in the right way to people about climate change? Is the scary scenarios, for example, the, mm. the response to get people to do something? I think often when you scare people too much, it, it just, you hear the fight, flight or freeze. And, and a lot of people just freeze and they think this is too big of a problem. There is nothing that I can do. I can't give up my car and I can't afford an, an electric car. And they maybe fail to realize that there's a million options in the middle there, of things that they can do. And often those, again, getting back to privilege, a lot of the things that you can do for the environment are actually less expensive. It's not necessarily about owning the Prius. You can just have the smaller home that takes less to heat and less to cool. And you can open the window instead of running the air conditioning. And you can throw it, put your clothes on the line instead of running the dryer. And there's a million things like that. But I do think the world is starting to wake up. It's hard not to with everything that's going, all of the natural disasters. But there's there's a lot of old dinosaurs that are in extreme <laughs> positions of power and that are kind of preventing the message from getting through as, as much as it needs to. And I read an article the other day that, that Gina Reinhardt, they discovered, had um, had given $4.5 million dollars to a climate change denying organization that puts out kind of junky science, stuff that's usually not peer reviewed. And it's not really academic science, but it's, you know, science-y enough looking that it can get spread all over the conservative news media. You're fighting with that. You've got people that care about it with their whole heart and soul and they want to see a better future for the planet. They want to see a future at all for the planet, but they're fighting against people that have got $4.5 million dollars to put into this. And most people in the world, they don't have the knowledge to know how to analyze science. You have to have done a lot of science yourself to be able to really look at a piece of science and, and know if it's real science or if it's a piece of crap propaganda. When you're fighting with that, it's very difficult. I've never fully understood why conservative politics, it, they're the ones that tend to deny the climate science, except sense that the big companies that have a lot at stake, that if they were to put in good legislation to prevent climate change, it would affect them. And potentially those businesses then give a lot of money to the politicians. But eventually you would think it'll get to a point where the conservative voters realize that the world is losing so much money because of these natural disasters that to ignore it is actually bad for business. Now that the film is released, what are the next uh, the next steps for you? Are you working on other films or other projects? I've actually got two more films in the works. Uh, one I've been working on for a little while. I'm still only at the early stages of it, though. Um, but it's going to be looking at Christmas, looking at the crazy hyper consumerism that goes on at Christmas and something like 28% waste. Her household, on average, um, is produced every December. So much of what we buy for Christmas presents is made in factories with very poor working conditions and then that all has to be shipped across the ocean and I also just want to kind of look at, at how we got here because a few generations ago it wasn't that way all of that has a huge toll for the environment and just for us personally you know, on a financial basis and stress wise and the other film I'm working on I spoke earlier a lot about koalas and that's because that's very much what's on my mind right now because I've stumbled into this other film about koalas and that all started because I learned that there is a huge plot of land that a developer has built um, near me on the Gold Coast and it actually has 10% of all of the local koalas in our area on that parcel of land. And that's looking to be removed. There's a lot of people fighting to stop that. But in my personal experience working on those habitat clearing sites, I don't have a lot of faith that the activists will win the battle. But I'd like to just raise a lot of awareness to what's going on there with deforestation in Queensland. There's a recently published United Nations Global Assessment Report that has said that the decline of the worst natural support systems means that human society as we know it is in danger. And according to the report, nature is being destroyed as at a rate which has never been, been seen before. And obviously we've talked about it, there's been a lack of leadership from state and federal government in this area. Protections and funding have been slashed. Emissions continue to rise. When you read about that, how do you keep hope for the future? 
You know, some days it is hard to have hope. When we were having the f- those wildfires raging, I had a dark day just a couple days ago. I found out that Binabara Lodge, which um, is a place that I would often go with my family when I was pregnant with my first daughter, we camped there. I would take visiting family there all the time, and it, it burnt down to the ground. Moments like that are heartbreaking. And again, with the koalas, koalas from the, one of the Gold Coast housing developments had been relocated out to Lamington National Park, and that was burning to the ground. I think it's okay occasionally to give yourself permission just to have a dark day and just I think sometimes you do need to just process what's going on in the world but I've got a lot of reasons for hope even though we are in a bleaker situation than we've ever been in terms of the planet there's also more of us fighting for change and that will make a difference slowly been hearing the stories of all of the tree plantings around the world India planted you know millions of trees recently and and that's all going to make an, a change it will if you were to just fall completely into despair and lose hope then you just can't live your life that way We'll talk a little bit, and you've touched on that uh, when you mentioned your roots. Have you experienced uh, sexism, and um, do you feel it's been a barrier for uh, the promotion of your ideas? I'll tell you a story. I've had lots of jobs in my life. A lot of people these days, I think the average is to only have a job for about two years. So I've had a lot. I've only ever lost two, though. I've ever been asked to walk away from two jobs in my life. Uh, The first time was when I was groped, and the second time was when I was grabbed. Both times I reported what had happened, and both times I was let go. Sexism is alive and well, and I was actually having this conversation with my dad, because he was trying to say that, you know, women have all the power now, and they can say that a man did whatever, and he'll lose his job. And I said, no, you don't understand. It's not that way. That hasn't been my experience. And in both of those situations, I was many years younger than the man and less senior in the company. So I had no power. And it's very easy for a company to just say that they're restructuring. Both of those jobs I wanted to continue. One of them was a wildlife related job. And so that was very, very difficult to have to walk away from that. In the film production, uh, when so you defend pretty alternative ideas, you go shake a little bit, you know, the status quo yeah. by asking those powerful organizations to change the way they produce those balloons and even threaten their the the industry in some in some ways. Did you find sexism came at play? There was a few cases of of mansplaining, I guess I would say, from um, men in the balloon industry that were trying to tell me that I knew better than them. But by and large, I didn't really experience a whole lot of sexism in that in the film. Both of the jobs that I mentioned before, where I was let go after having you know experienced abuse at the hands of a man, those were both in the building industry. So the building industry is still very much a boys' club. I saw extreme amounts of um, sexual harassment on the pipelines, in particular, extreme levels of it. It was 95% men out there. The women were a minority. I mean, you wouldn't believe the things that they say to you. And this was to all women working out there. Other industries are not quite as, as bad as that one. But but to defend that industry a little bit, um, and the pipelines in particular, even though you get like the really bad sexual harassment, you also get a lot of men that go the opposite direction and they're just complete gentlemen because they don't see a, a woman often on those jobs and, and so they're a complete gentleman. So you get both. Um, I don't think any woman would work out there for years like many of us have and like I did um, if it, if you didn't have that as well. Women are still not in decision-making positions. We you know it is still that glass ceiling to get to those mm-hmm. to those positions. And coming back to climate change, we know that women are already more affected by climate change. Do you feel we women can gain more influence? It reminds me a little bit of the the Black Lives Matter campaign. One thing we learned from Black Lives Matter is that having Barack Obama, a black man in the highest position on earth, didn't necessarily elevate all black people in America at all. And I think the same um, goes for women. I don't think it's necessarily about putting more women in leadership, although that would be wonderful. I think it's about respecting women's worth across all levels. As an example, I got my hair done yesterday by a lovely girl in Logan, and she um, runs a hairdressing salon out of her house. And she does it nights and weekends, and she's got three children, and she doesn't want a high-level executive position. What she wants is to be able to earn a respectable wage um, that fits around her family. And a lot of women are, are like that. 
you tend to see that women earn less money in most roles that are female dominated. So childcare, for example, that's, I mean, working in a childcare center, are you kidding me? From someone that's got two children and I'm run off my freaking feet every time I'm home alone with them to have, you know, dozens of them running around, that's hard, hard work. And often that would be probably half the pay of what a laborer, a male laborer would get on a construction site. And by the way, the female job does have a TAFE requirement, that childcare worker, and the male job doesn't. That's a walk-in off the street job. And you see that over and over. You know, school teachers, that's another example. And so women need to be paid fairly for that work. You know, for whatever reason, we, we still kind of live in a time as if it's the 1950s where the man makes the income and maybe a woman has a little part-time job just as a bit of extra pocket money. But that's not the case anymore. You know, So many women are on their own and they deserve to be treated fairly and they shouldn't have to drive a forklift in order to make a decent income. As we start treating women as human beings and respecting their worth and paying them fairly for the work that they're doing, I think it's only natural then that you'll see more women flowing into those higher level positions. I've shared with you to prepare this interview some some articles, some hot news <laughs> that are there at the moment. So um, obviously I couldn't not talk about the the fires happening mm. all over the world. Um, we've talked a lot in the media about the fires in the Amazon, the Indonesia, also Congo, mm. and there's bushfires currently happening in New South Wales and Queensland. So the article I shared was an opinion article from The Guardian regarding the bushfires happening here and I just wanted to know how this resonates with you as a, as a wildlife conservation specialist. We've got 80 wildfires raging through Queensland, we've got 60 in New South Wales. Usually the fire season would be starting about two months from now. We're seeing these record droughts all around the country and we have been for a long time now. It should be plain to everyone what's going on um, but un unfortunately It just isn't. So the Australian ecosystem is designed to have fires go through on a regular basis. And, you know, there's, there's species of plants that will only actually germinate after a fire. So that's, that's part of the ecology. But those are usually smaller scale fires. And when you're talking about big crown fires in the, uh, the tops of the trees on the scale that we're seeing, that's not part of our natural ecology. And it's heartbreaking when you think about the habitat, especially the, the fires that are raging through rainforests. It takes a very, very long time for a hollow to develop in a tree. You know, a tree grows and then the hollows kind of carve out over hundreds of years. And then the tree dies and it has a second life as a dead tree and then that becomes habitat for bats and other things and then it falls to the ground and then that becomes habitat to lizards and other things and a tree is incredibly valuable and it takes a very very long time for it to fill its full destiny. There was another article that I shared with you from the Scientific American called the benefits of adaptation measures outweigh the costs. So obviously the, this report calls for a massive investment in climate resilient infrastructure and other resiliency efforts. How do you explain the current political apathy at play at the moment to tackle climate change in Australia and worldwide? We are seeing more and more polarization to the mm. extremes of powers, you know, very anti-climate people being so-called mm. democratically elected. Like we were mentioning before how I heard that in 2016 and 2017, Gina Reinhart had put that $4.5 million dollars into a, a climate skeptic think tank. And then, you know, the their uh, publications, even though they're not really rigorous science whatsoever and really small sample sizes and, and basically created to come up with the, the desired outcome. People don't realize that that's junky science and then that kind of stuff gets splattered over social media. So social media hasn't helped at all, like how you had the Russian hacking of the US election. And you know sometimes you see news sources, the same, the same actual news outlet will create a, two articles on either side of an issue. So they'll say the climate crisis is going to kill us all and then they'll say you know it's it's all made up baloney and and then that gets put out Facebook is so clever where it knows people's political ideologies and then you can send things out to fire them up I think it's going to take us a little while to to get on top of that 
I did notice recently on Facebook, I got a notification that something somebody had sent out, an independent fact checker had showed that it was incorrect. More science communicators is really important. That's part of my motivation for Mm. what I do, Mm. creating a documentary instead of another piece of science, Mm. because I didn't want to just create another piece of science that just sits gathering digital dust. I wanted to create something that was going to be live and it was going to be experienced and actually make a difference. And we need more science communicators. That's clear. Mm. The fact that you can ask someone, do you believe in climate change? That that that's up for debate. That is proof that we need more science communicators. We need to break down this information into in a way that people understand and where it's not up for debate anymore. We talked about this actually with Alana Mann, the last guest that I had, uh, talking about the role of art, making people feel things more, the role of art in sharing those messages. Absolutely. Would you have cultural reference you would like to recommend to our listeners? It can be linked to our topic or not, something that uh, inspired you lately. I've got a couple. I've got two things I'd recommend. The first would be an app, actually. It's called Good On You. It's for buying clothing. So you can be out shopping and you can look up a particular brand and just see how well they're doing from an environmental point of view and also social. And you'll be surprised. I looked up Chanel the other day and I was mm-hmm. horrified. <laughs> oh, they did not rank well. Oh, really? Yeah. Then it gives you a detailed explanation of why mm-hmm. they get whatever ranking. And so, and so that's actually just fascinating. And the other one would be the Tao Te Ching. Uh, The Tao Te Ching is a spiritual text, and it's the second most published book on earth, bar the Bible. I recommend it constantly, and almost nobody that I speak to has ever heard of it. It was originally written in Chinese. It's been translated into every language on earth. For anyone that's interested in sustainability, it's a must read. So it's just 81 little poems, basically. There's a lot of themes around leadership, treading lightly on the earth, living in harmony with nature, a lot of great stuff about relationships. And it's been said by a lot of religious scholars that it's the most wise book ever written. Um, But it isn't actually a religious text. It's a a philosophy. There's a lot of stuff to... That would relate, even though it was written uh, 500 years before the Bible, they think, and they've actually found copies of it from 300 BC, written on bamboo scroll. How gorgeous is that? But it really, it can even relate to plastic pollution in terms of not having more than you need, you know, living well within your means and being satisfied with what you have. It really kind of can help round out someone that's already interested in in those sorts of themes. I'll take a look at it. I actually never heard of it either. So. I know, it's bizarre. Yes, yes. Thank you very much, Carly, for your time and coming all over from uh, from the Gold Coast the to see us. All the way from the Gold Coast. All the way from the, the Gold Coast. Thank you so oh, much. Thank I you really so much for appreciated our conversation. Oh, thank you. Thank you for listening. You can find all the details on Carly's documentary and work on our website, gosimon.org. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it around you. And see you in two weeks for another conversation with an inspiring woman. 